Welcome to the eighth episode of Tokenizing Everything, our weekly interview series with thought leaders in the tokenization industry. Today, we have yet another special episode prepared for you. With me are Jakob Bossert, COO of AlgoTrader, and Jason Bloom, responsible for business development, strategy, and sales. Before we begin, I have to mention that all opinion in today's podcast are solely personal and do not reflect the opinions of any involved parties. So let's start. Welcome, Jakob. Welcome, Jason. Great to have you. How are you? Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I'm very good, and I'm really. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in your session and discussing with you these topics. So, thanks for inviting us. Yes, yeah, from my side, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, the pleasure is mine. So, before we begin, I would like to maybe ask you to briefly introduce Algo Trader to our listeners, so they will know <laughs> what we are going to be talking about today. Sure, uh, if I may quickly. So Algotrade actually uh, has a value proposition in two areas. First is for the quant side of our business. It is about crypto funds who want to do a quant strategy. That means there is a so-called signal generation where they kind of decide automatically with software on buying and selling assets. And then of course, there's also the execution on the markets. Uh, this is the buy side and we have an order and execution management system, which we call Wireswarm, which is for the sell side. That is merely banks. And there is really about clients ordering crypto assets, digital assets, and the execution is happening through our platform. Yeah, perfect, Jakob. That's a great intro. And I think uh, everybody already knows why this is relevant for the listeners and in the tokenization space. So um, yeah, you recently published a great article on your website regarding how tokenization can democratize finance. So first of all, props at this point, um, I really loved reading it. So maybe you can kind of briefly talk about what you mentioned in the article and how actually tokenization provide this democratization in this field. Jason, you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, in general, tokenization is uh, obviously a, a huge topic at the moment. Um, there are a lot of projects being tokenized. People are assessing what kind of assets uh, are worth tokenizing, whether there can be uh, efficiency gains um, realized out of that tokenization. And in essence, we believe that um, in a couple of years, the current development of the market will lead to a, a very wide a range of tokenized assets in order to um, create secondary markets that have so far not yet existed and to create a, um, a better access and a more decentralized and global access to local assets um, as well. Uh, in essence, um, we uh, also mentioned the, one of the quotes of a visionary leader called Tom, Tom Tapscott, which basically said that um, at some point in the future, uh, we will be able to trade any kind of um, asset from our smartphones directly from our home, um, irrespective of whether that's a, a blue chip stock or uh, maybe um, a, spe a special diamond from, from a special area. Um, so it's, it's about the convergence of uh, liquefying secondary markets for assets that have not yet been able to be traded globally and um, converging that with um, existing global marketplaces uh, that already are being used frequently. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that perfectly makes sense. I think that's also what we see at the Amazing Blocks that kind of, you know, this, the tokenization can then allow us to have access to assets that, that we may not have had access before and then provide this financial inclusion. So it's a really great point that you mentioned there. So next, like you guys are very close in, in relationships also with institutions. And obviously everybody that's following the, the recent rallies in the crypto markets has heard about, you know, that institutions are now slowly and gradually tapping into this market. We've heard the news about MicroStrategy and so on, you know, tapping into this. But you're sitting at the source, obviously. But can you, can you kind of, you know, agree with the current stigma in the market that institutions are more willing to tap into this market? Or what is your take on this? Yes, it's a clear tendency that the growth uh, in this market is coming from institutional investors. We have this Fidelity report that was published last year, which already said that a third of all the uh, institutions out there are invested in some way in digital assets or cryptos, which is a lot. And I think it has quite increased over the past couple of months. We hopefully see a catch up of that report anytime soon. And I think also the recent rally is mostly about that. Uh, 
the institutions coming in. MicroStrategy, just being one of them, sort of the top of the iceberg, where we read about, it was very publicly known, but I guess there's many out there and we'll hear more. So the clear, uh, the growth is coming from that corner. Uh, if, I, if I may add, it's also pretty interesting to see the confirmation by financial institutions uh, who use uh, cryptocurrency or who currently mainly in Bitcoin um, with the narrative uh, as a hedge against the potential inflation of uh, fiat currencies. Um, so what has been basically the motivation of early adopters to hold crypto for so long, in particular Bitcoin, is um, actually being confirmed by a, a wider range of more sophisticated players in the market, which I believe is a, a great progress that we're doing or seeing at the moment. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great point. Everybody will see, you know, and probably I don't want to make predictions here, though, but I think everybody that's in the financial sector knows this inflation is expected to significantly rise in the upcoming years. So therefore, I fully agree, you know, this will play a significant role in terms of how we deal with this and, and how we diversify our portfolios to cope with these issues. So, though, of course, the institutions are, you know, now getting aware of this market, but what concerns do you see that they still may you know, kind of harm the, the acceleration of this progress and this, you know, into these institutions, you know, actually going all in on the crypto and blockchain market. I mean, they need a professional technology to access the markets uh, because we know that the liquidity is quite spread out there. Although there are big exchanges, market makers, brokers still, I mean, we never know where the liquidity actually lies. And already buying small quantities of cryptos or digital asset can slip the price significantly. And hence, we need platforms like AlgoTrader, giving those institutions the confidence we're always looking automatically to the use of sophisticated software to the liquidity and getting the best price and best execution. I think that will enable the further growth. So it's not that people are disappointed by their investments just because some things don't happen as they expected. Yeah, I fully agree with you on that point. So these institutions, you know, what we hear is that they mainly focus on, on Bitcoin, of course. So obviously everybody that is in the blockchain space knows that Bitcoin is only the tip of the iceberg. And obviously there's a lot of other trends, you know, after this, obviously tokenization, of course, but other things like DeFi as well and other exotic coins as well in the fields of IoT, AI and so on. Do you see... That, that these institutions are already looking into these other fields like tokenization, or do you see them firstly mainly focusing on Bitcoin? And if so, why do you think that is the case? If I may quickly do uh, say that the institutions are really at the law of the cryptocurrency because there everything's red, you know, the blockchains are mature, they kind of uh, have confidence in that. But in fact, everyone tells us in those talks that in fact, they want to have this broad variety of digital assets, you know, like art, uh, real estate, uh, small and mid-size equity. Uh, so they want more. So crypto is being kind of the, the fundament of it all. But in fact, they they are looking for, for that bigger universe of digital assets in general. And I think that's ultimately where it's going to land. Well, cryptos will take their voyage ahead, of course, and will also be part of that entire game. But in fact, the, the pie is much bigger, I believe. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's such a variety of use cases in this space. It's, it's you know, like this, the, the topic of this <laughs> podcast, it's tokenizing everything. And I think to some degree that's, that's almost, you know, possible. And I think there will be maybe in the future a token for almost everything. Who knows? So anyway, let's move a bit further to use cases. Sure that people ask themselves the question, is tokenization of everything already possible? Sure, they, to some degree, yes. To some degree, no. That's of course. To you, I've heard, you know, that especially small and medium-sized enterprises and respectively tokenizing private equity is an auspicious use case that you guys are very well known and very well familiar with. So can you give our listeners a brief overview of why this specific case is so interesting? Well, uh, we believe that, especially for a country like Switzerland, where 95% of the economy relies on SMEs, um, it is quite important to think about possibilities for those companies to attract capital uh, more easily and maybe even uh, beyond um, regional borders, uh, but more on a global level, and also the ability to uh, raise capital more efficiently um, in terms of uh, the transaction efficiency itself. So um, I think it's 
it's quite a good opportunity for um, early adopting SMEs to consider tokenizing not only their own shares, but maybe also other assets that they might have in the company, for example, bonds, or um, you, know, you could even go so far as to say uh, you would like to just tokenize uh, some patents or, or maybe raw materials, which uh, are value bearing and uh, will uh, remain valuable over time um, in order to fractionalize basically a company and, and make it more easily tradable. It, the result of this is that it would attract additional capital um, from special, not only from specialized in, in investors, but uh, it would also give the ability to uh, retail investors to um, invest in companies that are regionally known and all in the same context of that regional focus, which could, for example, also experience with food, right? So it's, it's quite a hybrid trend to source um, food from, for example, farmers that you know uh, from uh, your region. Why not also apply this to, to investing in companies um, that you're familiar with that are, are maybe in the same canton as you are or you know, in, in the same region and, and being able to specifically support these. And in addition, this will most likely also result in a more um, fairer valuation of these companies because once you have uh, more transparency in, re in regards to the information available and um, when you want to invest in something uh, and uh, better accessibility for investors, um, the valuation would also more be representative um, in terms of fair market value. Right? Yeah, I fully agree with your point there and it, it's a great Thing that you mentioned the retail investors so you already kind of went ahead for my next question obviously everybody knows that the crypto markets in general whether it be you know in the form of tokenization or, but mainly also crypto assets is is primarily designed for retail investors so and obviously as the earlier mentioned now institutions are gradually tapping into this do you do you see institutions even succeeding in this market and if so how yes i mean Sorry, go ahead, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, yes, most certainly they, they succeed, but there's one thing that needs to be aware of. It's, it's like Jacob said earlier, basically liquidity um, in crypto markets is, is a little bit like an iceberg, right? You have 20% looking outside of the, the water and 80% um, being below the water and the 20% above the water is basically liquidity available on the exchanges. So um, for, for investors to be able to capitalize and efficiently trade those uh, assets, they will need connectivity solutions that meet the standards of traditional um, capital markets. So while the infrastructure on the side of the exchange is, it was built and designed to um, deal with the loads of, of retail traders, um, it, it doesn't quite catch up yet to what institutional investors are used to. And this is basically where we help them get the same feel and, and that trading experience as they are used to in traditional markets. Yeah, Jakob, you wanted to say something or? It's just uh, the institutional, of course, we have also got different categories here of institutional investors, you know, we're not just thinking of the very big ones, you know, but also the mid-sized ones, smaller ones. They also have practically a difficulty in accessing uh, certain investments like the tokenization would enable. And if we provide the right technology, we would see much more traction in, in these markets. And, and, and again, moving a bit away from the pure retail market. But I think the technology is really there. We have it. We're talking here representatives in this call. Uh, we only have to kind of leverage it out and, and uh, kind of uh, spread it out, scale up. And I think uh, we'll see this growth uh, going on. Yeah, that's, I definitely agree with you that that will definitely happen. So in terms of fostering this growth in the future, how do you guys address this issue, like, you know, in terms of educational content on the one hand, maybe, or how do you approach people to get them into this or to kind of provide them with this trading infrastructure? What is your strategy there? I mean, generally speaking, we really have to start often from, from scratch. You know, we have to kind of say, you know, uh, what is it about digital asset? What is tokenization? Why is it important? And also why should investors go into this field? So we really kind of start. People have, have heard, of course, more and more. And the reason bull run has really helped us also the daily press has picked up quite a number of articles there and, and informing the, the general public. But still, um, you have to constantly at least tell the story as to why this is important and then uh, it will flow 
into into people's minds and they will see that this is not just kind of a, a hype that will will vanish quickly but something that will be sustainably there to influence the capital market so for us it's always important uh, we're not starting pitching Alba trader uh, in the first place but really explaining the fundamentals here of what we're talking about and seeing what the the, the potential of the technology and this development of the markets is all about and then you can discuss more detail and more more things but uh, we believe in that it's education and training is is, is key to it if i may add it also depends a little bit who you are talking to right if we have if we can broadly categorize um, our prospects or clients into three types of clients we we'll basically have the ones that have already been trading trading crypto uh, for a long time and they're quite i mean obviously you don't have to convince them of the, the merit of the asset itself um, but um, they will also know very well what the limitations in terms of trading infrastructure currently are and they will specifically ask to for solutions of those limitations while on the other hand um, you have um, institutional traders on the buy side so prop fund uh, prop traders or funds um, or family offices um, which are not you know very familiar yet with crypto and are trying trying to, to dip their toes into the market so to say and they, those who usually also not really have to educate about why it, you know the asset itself makes sense to has a merit of existence um, but they um, do not understand or do not know for example right away why the market is or the infrastructure in the market is uh, so archaic uh, so to say for actually such a, a modern asset class, right? Whereas on, on the other hand, uh, you have, for example, sell side institutions like banks, which appreciate if you give them a little bit more of a background and an overview of the entire market and maybe also give them um, some information or narratives that they can also take forward to their clients and use it to, to educate their own clientele as to why um, it would be interesting for them to have a closer look at the asset class. Yeah, uh, that's that's absolutely true, and I fully agree also with you, Jakob, that sustainability and sustainable growth in general is the key here, also to kind of provide trust to people in the space. As we all know, the ICO craze in 2017 has brought a lot of bad press to the crypto and blockchain space, and I think, you know, fostering the sustainability is, is going to be the key in terms of onboarding, you know, the traditional sector to the space. So to do this, obviously, also regulations need to be in place that allow the emergence of this token economy. And here, obviously, in Liechtenstein, the Liechtenstein Token Act was implemented that we leveraged at the Amazing Blocks, but also Switzerland is, is quite you know, advanced in this space. So to you, why are especially these two familiar you know, neighboring countries so advanced in this space? And why is that the case? And how can Liechtenstein and Switzerland even maybe potentially work together to further foster tokenization and crypto assets in the blockchain space and in the EU in general? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of in the nature of those two countries, uh, Liechtenstein and Switzerland, there's no natural resources, there is no big industry possibility, can't compete with the big countries. So so what you always want to want to push ahead is innovation, you know? uh, bright people having new ideas. And I think that was always in the concept of those two nations. And it's no wonder that also here in Switzerland, we have the Crypto Valley because this new approach here the blockchain was very much welcomed and it was a pleasure to see that uh, Liechtenstein really went live already a year ago so you already have kind of a full year of experience although a bit a different approach here with this uh, token container model and we'll see now with uh, Switzerland coming on um, soon by the way it will be on February 1 we have this ledger based technology as uh, securities excuse, excuse me ledger based securities are enabled by the law already on Feb 1 which will give quite a push and later this year the full law will be in place but it's not about here to compare them here in more detail but I would say uh, we'll see a lot of growth is coming then from this legal basis, you know, which will kind of 
uh, rule things like the ownership of a token, no? on, on how I can transfer the ownership, how I can exercise the right that is uh, represented by a token in a decentralized world, which is very important. And it shall be the same experience as we have with already traditional assets, you know, where it's clear if you're a shareholder of a company, you are kind of owning that company in respect of the number of shares that you, you have. Um, and I think we'll see that soon. And this collaboration shall be shall be close. You know, I think it's already very close between Liechtenstein and Switzerland. I think uh, you see that. And also, we hope we create together a good basis here for other countries to, to go the same way or, or enable that as well for the EU as well. And we can kind of be leading the way here to enable the path here for, for other parts of the world, which are also keen moving ahead and creating a good, uh, sound legal basis, which is the key also. You can't just have it without. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, the sound legal basis that you mentioned at the end is, is the key here also for like, of course, now institutions are getting into the market, but they're obviously not going all in on this space. They're not fully bought in, I would say, at least most of them are not yet. So I think even then, when we have this legal basis in place through throughout the entire EU, for instance, throughout the entire world, maybe in the future, then especially, you know, these traditional financial institutions will tap into this. So obviously, this will be a quite challenging time for banks, for instance. So, so which role do you see will have banks in the future of this space? Or do you think that they may even be jettisoned or do we may not even need them anymore? What role would you assign to banks in the future of the token economy? Um, so we believe that banks will indeed have um, or can have a vital role in that entire ecosystem, especially when it comes to, for example, creating primary markets for tokenized securities, um, which, for example, uh, most unregulated exchanges uh, can't or won't offer to trade, right? So um, one very uh, prominent use case that we are currently talking uh, about quite often is the possibility for banks to leverage their um, clientele, especially corporate clients, and uh, helping them to tokenize um, their companies uh, or any assets within, and then basically creating primary markets so that um, people or other companies can trade these assets um, with the bank as a principal or an agent, um, and hence creating basically a primary market for that, which is simply not existing yet. Yeah, Jacob, maybe you have something yeah. to add? Sure. Um, so it's, it's uh, Nicholas, you, you brought that nicely. So if you read the original papers uh, on the blockchain and what it uh, was designed for, you could figure it's sort of kind of creating a financial system outside the existing one, you know, on purpose. And, and that may be one thought because it's also then giving a new view to the system on how could we develop. But clearly the banks pay, play a key role here also in mass adoption of blockchain and digital assets trading and, and uh, uh, custodial services and everything that belongs to it because many people just have a bank account already they're used to buying shares here on the stock exchange on derivatives and now we are having a new asset class it comes to the same channel that the bank already provides to these clients the adoption is much easier so the client doesn't have to care what's in the background you know how do you store a private key on an hsm and all these technical things we have to resolve in the background for a client it can be yeah i own a, a token i own a crypto a currency a coin in my wallet here in my portfolio just as i own any share you name your favorite share that you have in in your portfolio and i think uh, the banks are the key here to this mass adoption and also they see the opportunity in moving there and going ahead yeah i fully agree banks can be the gateway basically for the traditional finance world to the blockchain or slash crypto tokenization space and i think if they really you know grasp this and and see the potential there then there will be you know a key driver of growth in the future i fully agree and though to kind of you know continue this thought uh, quickly do you think retail clients of banks will be affected by this at all or maybe just to some extent what is your take on this maybe the 
retail clients, you know, we see that many of them are not invested at all in any asset. So they're not really having any stock or so that they directly invest in. So also bringing them to invest here, maybe by uh, showing the attractiveness of digital assets and the potential they have, it might be a big gain for those retail clients because they can really uh, participate in, in those new asset classes that are independent of the existing uh, uh, markets. And, and also the bank could profit then from kind of winning more clients investing and, and, and charging more fees and everything. So the retails uh, will be affected, I am sure. But again, also here, it needs a lot of education and training. So to motivate people and say, look here, it's not just good to have a savings account and keeping your fiat money there all the time and hoping it would grow over the decades. There is more to be done in today's world. Yeah, definitely. And I think also through through kind of offering services in the space, banks will allow people to maybe tap into other investments that they may even understand. You know, people may not understand Bitcoin or Ethereum or so on, but they may understand, you know, investing into a classic car they know or investing into an art piece or, or something like this. But like, I, let's continue a bit with, with the use cases. We earlier mentioned the use case of SMEs, for instance, and gen generally private equity tokenized. But do you see other use cases also as very auspicious? Obviously, any use case has its own benefits, but could you maybe single out a couple of that, that to you are quite interesting specifically? I mean, there are quite a few use cases already on the market, which uh, I personally already find very interesting and uh, have thought of um, uh, until I saw them. One particular example would be, for example, the tokenization of cattle, um, so that you can basically just, not just, uh, instead of buying part of a ranch, you, you actually buy part of, you know, of the cows that are living on that ranch and uh, being used. Um, or uh, another example would be the tokenization of um, fan engagement. There is uh, one project that uh, issues tokens um, for every major soccer club, uh, which fans then can basically buy and use to influence team decisions with, with their votes based on the amount of tokens that they're holding. So the, the amount of use cases is, is, is quite uh, almost unlimited. And um, basically pretty much everything that allows you to, you know, uh, where you can influence a decision with a vote or where you can transfer a, a defined value is a potentially a use case for tokenization. As long as there are enough people interested in participating in it or owning it, um, there will most likely also eventually be a token for any given asset. I fully agree uh, with Jason. So uh, the tokenization will have no limits whatsoever. Um, and also here, particularly for, for Switzerland, of course, I mean, uh, watches, I mean, very expensive watches you always kind of dreamed of as a child. Uh, uh, you can never reach uh, in your lifetime. Um, at least you could buy uh, a token, a few tokens and, and participating in, in, in such a um, actually luxury good. Um, maybe another use case more in the consumer retail is loyalty points. We think that's going to be a big market here. I mean, everyone owns uh, loyalty point from your favorite uh, coffee chain or, or retail store or whatever it may be. And you always have the wrong loyalty points to do the next transaction. You're just about to execute on the internet. You wish you had the right loyalty points to get five, 10% off. And maybe another one out there has it. And, and exactly this kind of availability of platforms and tokenization of, of such values, if you want to, um, is, is, is what the society will want to and, and and also striving towards and I think also here in those consumer goods it's 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 evident that the potential of tokenization is huge and uh, we, as I said no limits but there's a few cases where we believe is already now everything is available and of course that's more um, what we mentioned so far. Yeah, I think uh, you you were perfectly on point with this. It's, it's, it's almost limitless what you can tokenize. And it's great. I already saw the use case watches that you mentioned. I was actually going to ask you with this about this. Obviously, it makes sense. You're from Switzerland and um, people always connect, uh, you know, special watches with Switzerland. So it's also a great use case that we're currently looking into. So, yeah, thank you for this. Uh, last but not least, to kind of wrap this up, 
maybe you both can quickly give your take on where do you see blockchain and tokenization in say 10 years from now i always like to ask myself my guests this question obviously you cannot give a definite answer to this no one can but just maybe your kind of opinion on this so the token will be the main representation of of a value of of something we can move around uh, buy sell on uh, in this decentralized world we live in so it will be really a mass penetrated kind of market here all over the globe and it will be the mainstream here so tokenization is not just kind of uh, an alternative to existing classic uh, uh, ways of going for buying and selling values it's going to be really the majority of the pie is going to be based on tokenization and and probably will also have done different wording for it because it will be so much mainstream so i believe the potential is so big it will really ultimately penetrate so i hope it's going to ha really happen in the next 10 years but i believe we're on a very good track to make that happen yeah uh, on my on my opinion um, i believe also that um, will heavily influence um, how asset value will be transferred in the future and will be tightly integrated into a lot of services uh, which in our daily use. However, I think most of the people, just like when they use the internet, they don't speak about the usage of HTTP protocols. Um, just like that, they will probably also not, not even be aware that, um, I don't know, that the mortgage they're currently um, getting um, in a decentralized manner or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, is basically created or transacted via a blockchain network or a decentralized ledger. Um, so it will just become a, a core infrastructure of human society um, with only a few geeks uh, or specialists um, trying to really understand and push it to the limits. But for most, it will just have to work. And as long as it does, they probably won't really care how it exactly functions. Yeah, that, that was a perfect finish there, Jason. So first of all, thank you very much, Jakob and Jason, for, for your great insights here. I think now it's always great to see different perspectives of this space. And now we have already have a new perspective for our listeners. And so really appreciate you taking the time. And you gave some awesome answers and a lot of snippets I can use, you know, for educational videos in this space, by the way. So it's so a great, uh, you know, input there. So it's always great to talk to you guys. Um, I would love to have you back in the future. And um, yeah, stay safe, stay healthy. And thank you for participating. Thank you for having us, Nicholas. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Thank you. It was, the pleasure was mine. And to our listeners, um, quickly, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. In case you have any questions, feel free to always reach out to me or any one of my team. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, my email. And also if you have any, you know, you know insights or any information regarding the podcast whether you want to join participate of questions you would like to ask our next guests feel free to always reach out and let me know see you in the next episode and stay healthy